The importance of the real book cannot be overstated. Its ubiquity as a musical tool has shaped generations of jazz musicians, the same way that the distortion pedal has shaped rock and roll or the sampler shaped hip hop. The identity of its authors is a trade secret so tightly kept it might as well be the secret formula to Coca-Cola. So then what is the real book and why is it so important and what does it mean? Now to answer this question, we need to take a look at the history of something called fake books, compilations of sheet music put together for the benefit of a working musician. If the musician didn't know a particular song, a fake book was an easy way for that musician to fake a performance or flesh out an arrangement on the spot. Many fake books were bootleg Xerox compilations of 3x5 cards called tune decks, which were a popular form of mail order sheet music for radio stations in the 1950s. These tune decks compilations were technically illegal since the publishing companies and composers never received any dime in royalties from the sales of them. Even still, these compilations were so common that in 1964, the FBI field office in Cleveland observed that practically every professional musician in the country owns at least one of these fake music books as they constitute probably the single most useful document available. Tune decks stopped being printed in 1963 and so those fake books stopped being made. However, the need for fake books still persisted. This spawned imitators, which were of uh, significantly poorer quality. Often these were simply cut and paste jobs from piano sheet music. Besides looking kind of crappy, the poor quality mainly comes down to chord symbols. Chord symbols can sometimes be a little bit tricky because you can interpret the same group of notes in multiple ways. Is this grouping of notes E flat, G, A, C, a C minor six in first inversion, or an A minor seven? and flat five in second inversion. It's ambiguous. We don't actually know until we have the proper context. For this reason, we say that these chords are homophonic. They're chords that sound the same, but there are different chord symbols that they get depending on their context. Because piano sheet music publishers generally did not care about the context necessary for a musician to fake a piece of music, they wrote whatever chords they felt like, and those chords ended up in the fake books. Because of this, all of these fake books were generally seen as completely useless by performing musicians. So in the mid 70s, a small a group of students and faculty at the Berklee College of Music in Boston decided that they would try and fix the problem with fake books by creating the real book. Transcribing famous recordings of jazz musicians performing American songbook standards, the group put together another unlicensed fake book compilation meant to update the repertoire. It was an immediate hit. Bassist Steve Swallow was faculty at Berkeley at the time, and in a conversation with jazz scholar Barry Kernfield, he said, In order to walk to the rooms where I taught my ensembles in Berkeley, I had to run the gamut of dozens of rehearsal rooms down a corridor. On either side of this corridor, I would hear 20 or 30 guys playing standards, and a month after the real book was published, all of a sudden, I was hearing the right changes to tunes that had previously been butchered. Just like that, the standard repertoire of jazz music was set in stone. If a tune wasn't in the real book, chances are it wouldn't be called at a jam session or at a gig. It opened up the vast world of jazz improvisation to many hungry young students looking to see how jazz was performed and how to do it accurately. The demand for the real book spread quickly far beyond Boston. Enterprising entrepreneurs printed copies as fast as the copyist printer would print them. Buying them was an illicit activity but many people bought them out of the back of somebody's trunk. There were problems, though, with the real book that still persist to this day, 40 years later. For all of the authority that Berkeley brought to the real book, it was still laden with many errors, which were listed in long correction ledgers in later editions. Popular American songbook tunes were kind of dumbed down to an extent and simplified to a level far beyond where they were originally performed or written. There were also some omissions of popular jazz standards like Lover Man or Willow Weep For Me. And in lieu of these important Important standards, there were a lot of these contemporary jazz songs written by faculty members at Berkeley at the time, like Gary Burton and Steve Swallow. Still, these problems did not stop the ascent of the real book as it influenced multiple generations of jazz musicians. In 2006, Hal Leonard purchased all of the licenses necessary to use the music in the real book and released their own legal version. They called it the sixth edition and sold it for less than what the illegal books were going for. This shrewd business move not only drove all of the illegal books off the market, but it also further expanded the reach of this fantastically useful tool. And like anything that makes life easier, many people felt like it was making life too easy, that it was simplifying things so much that the music was becoming watered down, soulless, and generic. This leads us to the crux of this particular video. The real book is a jazz shibboleth. 
Let me explain. About a year ago, I was at a jazz jam session at a bar in Washington, D.C., and actually not too far from where Duke Ellington was born and grew up. Jazz jam sessions sometimes have a reputation for being what are called cutting sessions, hyper-competitive matches of musical ability. This sort of session wasn't nearly that intense, it was very welcoming, but there was still a sort of, I don't know, vibe to it. When the standard Autumn Leaves was called, somebody asked, what key? The house bass player replied, Yeah, we'll do it in the usual one. Now, I knew what he meant. He wanted the song to be played in G minor, the key in which Bill Evans and Miles Davis recorded the song. Because of that, there's also an intro bass riff that you're supposed to play if you're playing the song in G minor. For somebody raised on the real book, however, you might not actually know these details. In the real book, Autumn Leaves is in the key of E minor, so somebody might think that E minor is the usual key. The bass intro riff isn't written in either. The house bassist could have said G minor, but he didn't, because it was a test. Another time a few years earlier, a friend of mine was barred from playing at the Fat Cat Late Night Jazz Jam Session here in New York City. He made the mistake of bringing a real book with him, and he was told he couldn't play because the Fat Cat Jazz Jam Session was a professional jazz environment, and he should come back when he was ready. Dickish, I know, but older jazz musicians are extremely protective of the traditional culture of learning music by ear off recordings. It's because of this, knowing the proper key of a jazz standard is shibboleth to many jazz musicians. A shibboleth is a word distinguishing an in-group from an out-group. It comes from the Bible, and instead of reading it to you, I think President Bartlett should explain. It comes from the Bible. Then said now unto him, say now shibboleth, and he said sibboleth, for he could not frame to pronounce it right. It was a password, a way the army used to distinguish true Israelites from imposters sent across the River Jordan by the enemy. You may recount the scene in Inglorious Bastards where Lieutenant Hickox uses the English hand symbol for three versus the German one. Or in The Wire, for example, where Chris figures out that a drug dealer is a rival from New York City because he doesn't know who young Leek is. It seems ridiculous to make this comparison between these life and death situations and the performance of jazz music, but in certain communities, the real book is certainly treated as such. People can be extremely protective of something as personal as art, and the real book is seen as a dilution of it. The rise of the real book coincided directly with the rise of higher jazz education in the 1970s and the 1980s, and so the two of them are inexorably linked. There is a lot of cultural resentment to the rise of the jazz academy and towards the commercialization and commodification that it might represent. This is why I use the term shibboleth because there is a religious connotation here. Some things in the realm of music are sacred, and <laughs> the real book is not one of them. Blasphemy! The real book is kind of like jazz tablature. It can be an amazing learning tool at first, but it can very quickly develop into a crutch. I do share some of this trepidation towards the real book. I think it's important for young jazz musicians to wean themselves off of it as soon as possible. Amy Nolte has a great video explaining how she left her real books behind after learning this from John Clayton. But at the same time, I'm a little on the fence here. I got started with the real book, the illegal kind, and it was immensely useful for me when I was first learning how to play jazz. When you read a letter on Barry Kernfield's website from one of the original original authors of the real book, you get a sense of how earnest they were in the pursuit of learning about jazz music. They weren't looking to dilute the music, they were simply looking to help their fellow musicians understand it better. This is the complex legacy that the real book has left. By the way, if you want to be taken seriously and still have a real book on the bandstand, be sure to cover it with coffee stains. Maybe if my friend had one of these, he would have been taken more seriously and allowed to sit in at the jam session at Fat Cat. Hey everybody, thank you so much for watching. My name is Adam Neely. I have a new video coming out every Monday. If you enjoy what I do, please consider joining my Patreon because it's through my patrons over at Patreon that I'm able to do this every week. So thank you so much for watching and until next time, peace.